The views expressed by the host of this podcast are not opinion-based or for entertainment purposes. They are actually facts and truth, no matter if other people like it or not. It is the Detroit sports truth, and nothing can ever stop it from being correct. Hey there, Detroit sports fanatics, and welcome to episode 192 of the Detroit Sports Truth on Spreaker. I'm Taylor Phillips. I'm with my top co-host on the podcast, Ed Smith. Thanks so much for being on here as always. How are you? Well, wonderful. Feeling fine, Taylor. Um, You know, as 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 it was mentioned and shown on our social media accounts, you know, unforeseen circumstances had to unfortunately cause the last minute postponement of the episode for last night. But in a way, I'm kind of glad that it happened because, man, uh, after what happened tonight, it, it, it needed to be talked about with, with great urgency. Yeah, I believe so. I'm really sorry to hear that. But uh, our show is still on, and we're ready to tip things off with the Pistons. Left side line, three, and he answers. The Pistons uh, beat the 76ers one night. Once uh, one ten to ninety seven Wednesday, and then they lost to the Cavaliers just two hours ago, one fourteen to one oh six in the same building. Andre Drummond finished with twenty eight with twenty points, eight rebounds, and zero assists. Obviously, in the Cavaliers game, at the end of the game though, he had to be restrained after threatening to uh, knock out Justin Spiro, who was sitting at one end of the basketball court and was telling Drummond to shoot free throws underhanded. Shooting free throws underhanded is illegal in the game, but uh, Drummond shouldn't send anyone threats in person, not any threats, not any type of threat whatsoever. True threats are not protected by the First Amendment. Uh, Could this be a fine or suspension? Uh, That's that's my question. Uh, Fine or suspension... Uh, in terms of what actually went down, I don't think so, because all he did was just, yes, he had to be restrained, but in terms of what we saw and what's been, what was actually recorded, um, he did not physically attack Spiro, he did not lay a hand on Spiro, yes, he, you know, as, as evidenced by some tweets earlier, um, but whether it be by Jeff Moss or someone else, uh, he did, you know, talk back at Spiro, and like I said, he had to be restrained, but I think, uh, if anything, if he is a, to face some type of some type of punishment, he'll he'll be fine. He may be fine, but like I said, since he didn't actually go into the crowd, didn't have any physical contact with any defense, including Sparrow, especially Sparrow, uh, no suspension will come about. But um, it's crazy because you know this is a really. Um, I think there's definitely some fault on 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 Drummond's side here because I think he should not be. I understand this is a part of his game that he probably doesn't like being talked about, uh, and it's sure frustrating him that his poor play is not only uh, causing, I guess, in his mind, mockery from not just opposing people and uh, the strategy that they're now team that teams are now uh, opposing or now employing, I should say, but now it's even calling causing. Uh, um, you know, fans of his um, of his own to start suggesting, hey, maybe can you do this? Because you know, your free throw shooting is killing us. You know, you're killing me, Smalls. It's the saying I would go here. Um, but I think Drummond, you know, I think he needs to work on that issue because, like I said, if if he's if, like in Moss brought up uh, in, a break, in a great point here, if this happened to him at home. What is he, he going to expect fans on the road to do, especially now that they know about this? So um, he's definitely have got, to, he's got to keep his emotions in check for sure um, and not worry about whatever what, what he else is trying to do. That's what some fans are there to do. They like to heckle, but in this, in this case, I don't think Spirit was heckling. I think, you know, if you believe um, Jeff's side of the story as well as others, um, because there were not just him, there was other people there that witnessed it. They said Spiro was not trying to troll or be mean or, or jerk. He was just politely suggesting um, uh, that, you know, maybe Drummond should try this method. Now, maybe Drummond didn't like how it was repeated constantly, but no matter what the tone, if you, if you see something getting uh, constantly shown at you multiple times and, you, and you've already didn't like it the first time, I can see where it might trigger something off of uh, uh, itself, uh, you know, break, uh, a potential breakpoint. But 
And I still believe that Drummond's actions, though, were completely out of line, and there's no issue, you know, that for that type of reaction, it was not needed. Completely, a complete total overreaction on the part of Drummond, for sure. Yeah, that's true. Of course, we don't uh, want. Of course, we don't want Andre Drummond to get suspended for the All Star game. If we, if we think about it, he was selected as an All Star reserve the night before, and. Uh, and of course, he's not going to get sus- He's probably not going to get suspended, but still be fined, as you just mentioned, Ed. Uh, that's that's still good news because uh, Drummond is needed for the All Star game, and the Pistons need Drummond. They don't want him suspended for at any for any games at all. That's uh, he, he's still a va- despite all all his free throws being missed. Uh, He's still a valuable asset in terms of rebounds and points. He usually gets double doubles like almost every game, and, yeah. and that's so valuable. That's so valuable. Yeah, he's arguably. You know, I wouldn't say arguably. To my view, he is the most valuable player. There's a reason why, right? He's what their only piston, the only piston being selected as an All Star period starter or reserve. Um, you know, in terms of uh, playing on the actual. Eastern for the Eastern Conference All Stars this year. There's a reason why because he's that talented and he's that good. Unfortunately, there is uh, a major issue with a certain aspect of his game that he needs to work on. But still, uh, you can't deny the talent that he possesses and what type of right, like I said, uh, what type of value brings every single time he's on the floor. So there's there's a reason why you know in a way Spiro was wanting to you know I guess you could say. Uh, repeating this notion because he knows the talent that, that Drummond has, and he just wants to make sure that he improves on this part of his game. So, in the turn, not only that it helps him, it helps the team as a whole. So, yeah. And moving on here, uh, most uh, either most or some people, including uh, fans and media, were uh, wondering why Andre Drummond was was not an All Star starter and w- was instead an all-star reserve player it but but it's really simple guys it it's his it's his lack of uh, hitting free throws and and it's it's uh, it's, it's uh, hurting the pistons but not killing them but hurting them right that's really what it comes down to comes down to in terms of instances like some of these players that are guaranteed all-star starters like you know like LeBron James the Kyrie Irvings uh, of that nature the Russell Westbrooks Russell Westbrooks, uh, they, you know, they're completely all around players. Um, they're well rounded in just about every single area of their game in most instances. Uh, whereas with Drummond, <clears throat> excuse me, he's good in some, great in others, but in this one certain key area, he's completely bad at it. So, um, I could see why that would be a detriment into him potentially earning, earning votes as a starter for the All Star game. Uh, so I wasn't particularly too irritated or annoyed that Drummond didn't make the starters uh, list. As long as he made the game, made the team, period. So that's all that all that counted and mattered. Because the time the season is having so far, and knowing the talent and potential that's there for him, I expected him to be an All Star this year. And that's all that, that that mattered to me, starter or not. You know, as long as he was there. Uh, but if he wants to see himself in future All Star games, he's got to improve his free throw shooting. Period. Yeah, absolutely. That's a no-brainer. His uh, free throw shooting is uh, slightly improving, but still not not nearly enough. If if we put it this way, Pistons are in Toronto Saturday at six thirty. The Toronto Raptors. Uh, let me see. Looking at the standings. Uh, Division. I know Toronto's in. I know Toronto's in one of the top. Uh, what is it? The top four teams in the East. They are in second place at thirty-one and fifteen. There you go. Two and a half behind the team that played the Pistons tonight, the Cavaliers. Quick note about the Cav game. You know, as the score would indicate, indicate uh, the Pistons. They were. It was. They were. It was a valiant effort for sure. But again, it was just too much more so of. Uh, Cleveland, when they're on, when they're at their best, you know, i.e. LeBron, Kyrie, and Kevin Love, their big three contributing. Not to mention uh, Tif- uh, Timothy Mozgov from the bench, uh, almost having a double double of his own. You know, it's just 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 too much to overcome from Detroit's end. You know, most nights when you have an offense score like that, all your starters contributing offensively, 
Um, most times, nine times out of ten, you're going to win. But for a team like Cleveland, uh, just too much to overcome. Uh, but back to Toronto, you know, this is basically a back-to-back set stretch of games where the Pistons, you know, if they can win at least one of these, uh, you know, gives them, you know, a little bit of boost of momentum towards, so to speak, as we head towards head towards the All Star break. And really, it's a win that they need now because after you know after this loss and seeing what you know what the Miami Heat and the Boston Celtics are, are starting to do now, now the Pistons are down to seventh currently in the Eastern Conference standings. They were at six. They were above Miami because of the loss tonight to Cleveland, and I think, what, the Heat winning, I believe, um, it, it bounced, you know, it dropped the Pistons down as well. So now they're seventh, barely above Indiana for the eighth spot. So, they, you know, it's been, the last thing they needed was some type of, you know, negative, uh, you know, negative headlines from a PR perspective. So seeing this happen on the floor from, one of their, star, from, from their star player, the last thing they wanted to see. So hopefully they do some of the right to ship so we can head so they can head to the all star break with a more uh, positive outlook for towards the second half of the season. The Miami Heat beat the Milwaukee Bucks one oh seven to one oh three at Bradley Center on Friday night. So that does move the Heat up to sixth place. And with the Piston lost the Pistons dropped to seventh place, as you mentioned. The Heat have now won three straight. The Heat are twenty six and twenty one. The Pistons are twenty five and twenty two. The Pacers are four, are twenty four and twenty two in eighth place. Pistons also play in Brooklyn on Monday night against the Nets at uh, Barclays Center. The Nets are twelve and thirty five in fourteenth place in the East. That that should definitely definitely be an easy game, no doubt. Pistons in that building just cannot get a win though. They they need they need a win. There's like some type of weird voodoo there, and they definitely need a win because of this next stretch that's coming up here. Um, you know, because after that, you got what three, four, four teams against uh, four game, four straight games against teams that that you know, like I said, have either a a winning record in the Eastern Conference, b uh, are above the Pistons in the Eastern Conference standings, you know, or c a little bit of both. Um, they're facing, you know, and it's a mix and match. They're at home against, against, I mean, on the road against Boston. That's going to be on the 3rd at 7.30. Then the next night, uh, on the 4th, on TNT, that's going to be a Thursday night game. Remember, this is the game that now is being bumped up to primetime coverage to be shown on TNT. They'll be at home facing on the Knicks. Then that Saturday, the day before the Super Bowl, they'll be on the road against Indiana. And then on that following Monday, they'll be back at home facing the Raptors once again. So this is a big, big stretch of games coming up that the Pistons have to do well in terms of improving their standings um, uh, towards, you know, in the Eastern Conference as we get towards the All-Star break because they got one more game after that before, before, before the break, and it's another home game against the Nuggets. Hopefully they can get some revenge in that one. So, again, very important stretch of games for the Pistons coming up as we head towards All-Star break. Yeah, and then the Pistons play on Wednesday in Boston and Thursday at home against the New York Knicks. Uh, and that and then uh, Saturday in Indiana on February 6th. Then on Monday at home against the Raptors. Wednesday, Wednesday uh, Monday at the 8th. And then Wednesday the 10th, the Pistons host the Denver, the Denver Nuggets. And that that's the last game before their All-Star break. They still got a they still got quite a few games to go bef- before then. I, I think uh, this should be uh, a seesaw of a of a uh, remaining uh, road down to the All Star break, uh, so to speak, uh, as we speak. Uh, uh, Justin Spiro just messaged me on Facebook and told me that Drummond was very mean to me tonight. I told him, I see. Ed and I were just talking about about it recently. He said, bummer, I missed it. I told him it'll be archived. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Moss sent out a tweet saying, you know, I own an Andre, saying he owns an Andre Drummond autographed shoe. Um, he will bring it, and on this upcoming Tuesday for the next DSR podcast episode, he'll probably bring it in studio to throw it at Spiro. Maybe you should throw it underhand, like one uh, one person suggested in a replying tweet. 
Yeah, and I'll be there. I can't wait to see it. Oh, I, that's wonderful. Perfect timing. Yep. Yeah, we're yeah, we're going to we're going to have a heck of a time. Yeah, um in investigating the real truth about um Andre Drummond and the autograph shoe and everything. Um uh, yeah, um I'm going to be there. I'm going to be a guest uh I'm going to be a special guest on, on the podcast in the studio on Podcast Detroit, the uh, active the uh, upon Activate Gaming podcastdetroit.com is the website. You can download the Podcast Detroit mobile app to to stream me, Jeff Moss, and Justin Spiro for episode 16 of the Detroit Sports Rag podcast. That is every Tuesday night from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern. 7 p.m. Tuesday late afternoon, more appropriately speaking, more technically speaking. And, and for those that can't, yeah. and for those who are looking for the Podcast Detroit app, um, I'm sure, pretty sure you can, for those, if you own Android, you can definitely look for it in the Google Play Store. Yep. And, and for those using Apple, you can find it in the App Store. So that covers everything, uh, Pistons, doesn't it? Well, there was one minor thing that I wanted That's to right, talk yeah. about. That's right, yeah. Yeah, the this whole, Pistons. Uh, craziness involving Drummond exploded. Pistons um, are interested there in. Been some, yeah, there have been some talks, some rumors going around that the Pistons might actually be interested in uh, pursuing uh, New Orleans Pelicans forward, power forward, Ryan Anderson. Um,. And after looking at some of you know Anderson's numbers recently, I can I can see why in certain games um, he definitely gives them what they need in terms of uh, position of need. He's a stretch four who can score. Uh, I guess you could say he's more effective than Ersan Ilya Silva is. I'd say, and that's uh, that's by a wide wide margin. Uh, Ilya Silva, he can be good in some instances. He can good, he, be, he can be good in spots, but that's about it. He's very, it's, it's, it's a bit limited to his offensive uh, output. Whereas Anderson has just been, you know, what early twenties at le- at least, and you know he's he's going for high twenties, thirty point games almost every night. Very good number of rebounds too. Um, I've always mentioned before that the Pistons need to get another four to help. Drummond with some capacity. Uh, I should have specified there was m- not so much offensive. Well, it's a little bit of both. Offensive, so that Drummond doesn't have to feel the need to try and score 20 points every night, but also some defensive help, too, in terms of grabbing rebounds. Like, for instance, in his last game, uh, in this one, one the recent game against Sacramento, uh, Anderson had nine rebounds, scored was 36 points. You know what I mean? Something like that. He can give you type, that type of balance where him and Chumman in the front court could be a, a very rare one-two punch, uh, or or this or this, or this instance a left hook to the body, then a right cross to the head. That type of combo where it can put you out in more ways. So uh, I'm very intrigued to see how they could go go about trying to get Anderson. But I did hear some other reports saying that more than likely, uh, if they wanted to get Anderson, they would not get him before the trade deadline. So they might. They would rather just wait till the off season and play their, and play their chances right then and there. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, but it will be interesting. I I think the Pistons need Ryan Anderson. Uh, I I think uh, I think he would be uh, another e- extra piece that they need. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, and think about this. I think, you know, put it into a perspective. They need a guy like Ryan Anderson the way the Tigers needed a guy like Justin Upton before they pulled the trigger. Yep, absolutely. That's uh, that's uh, very similar. So, with all the Pistons news out of the way, thanks Ed for the uh, update. I almost forgot about that. So we're going to transition to college basketball. Valentine for the win! Yeah! Yeah! The Michigan State Spartans destroy the Northwestern Wildcats 76-45 to in Evanston. They were bombing threes all over the place, as seen on 
ESPN. And they just wouldn't let up. They led 36 to 24 at halftime. Just an, just a very easy win for the for the Spartans. And Spartans will uh, trying to look at my uh, script here, my uh, CDY Sports Update script here, and see who they play next. I know they play uh, on this Sunday. Right now they will play Rutgers next. I believe it is this Sunday. Oh yeah, and then they will not play another game until the following Saturday. Uh, in their class, their usual pre-Super Bowl class with Michigan. This time it's going to take place in Ann Arbor. Um, most instances, it would be on a Sunday, but since CBS is airing the Super Bowl and has Super Bowl coverage dedicated all day that Sunday, it's going to be on Saturday uh, the 6th at, at 2 o'clock. So they only have one game to play uh, before uh, their class with the Wolverines. But this was a very, very nice game. Um because, you know, some would say this would be a potential trap game after the emotion, you know, getting, excuse me, getting a very nice win against Maryland on home floor and the impending match with Michigan um, coming up soon. So some would say this is a trap game territory, but they more than exceeded that. Uh, they blew Northwestern out the friggin' water here. So business as usual. I expect them to do the same with Rutgers. It'll be real interesting to see how things will play out with that Michigan game and be interesting to see if uh, Karis LeVert is because I, I, I last I checked I don't think LeVert has still played yet it's still day to day with his injury Taylor has he, has he uh, returned yet because if not this might be an opportunity for him to make his return uh, here uh, against against the Spartans yeah I, I definitely agree Michigan beat Rutgers 68-57 to on either Tuesday or Wednesday uh, this past Wednesday. Wednesday, thank you. It, uh, it was a slow start. Rutgers, I saw, led 11-7 to at one point, and they kept leading until Michigan came back uh, to lead by uh, very little at halftime. Uh, and Michigan just uh, went ahead the rest of the game, and they uh, had to hold on by 11 to win. Margins from both teams and both halves. It was, uh, you know, not that easy. Michigan had the had the advantage, but like I said, in both those halves. But still, it was by single digit margins. So I think they might have underestimated Rutgers a little bit, and Rutgers probably um, over, you know, overachieved in how they played. Uh, but still, good production from guys like Derek Walton and and especially from Duncan Robinson. Um, got eighteen points from him. Aubrey Dawkins with 11 points from the bench, showing good uh, backup support in that in that regard. Uh, but it, this, it clearly shows this is one of those in instances where you wish desperately that Karis LeVert was back um, so he could probably help you out in some of these stretches, some of these spots here. So that's why I'm inclined to see whether or not, A, will he be healthy enough to play against Michigan State? And if, you know, even if he isn't, you know, when, when you wonder, when will he step back on the floor for – uh, for, for the Wolverines this year. Michigan will play at Penn State at noon in New York, New York at Madison Square Garden. The same night, the Wolverines and Nittany Lions hockey teams will play each other, will face off with each other somewhere. I, I think that's at Madison Square Garden Madison as well. Square. I believe it is also at MSG because I remember seeing a yeah. post on Facebook from the Big Ten uh, promoting this, right? Promoting you know uh, yeah. two you know two schools, two two different that's sports, right. one one night, one arena, that sort of thing, and it, it showcased the logos for Penn State and Michigan. So pretty sure, right? The men's basketball teams will face off at noon, and then later that night, the men's uh, the the hockey teams will will, will collide as well. I believe you're right. Let me uh, look at the schedule for the ice hockey team for the Maize and Blue. That, that is at 7 o'clock on BTN. And is it at MSG? That's correct. Well, you're right. There you go. <laughs> kind of like a double double treat. 
for us all. Michigan then plays Tuesday at home, home against um, Indiana. That's uh, yeah, that's at nine o'clock. That's at Chrysler Center. That's on ESPN, and then the Michigan and Michigan State game. That that um, let me see here. Oh, oh wait. Oh yep yep. They're home against Michigan State at two p.m. the day before Super Bowl Fifty. That that will be on CBS. Both both the Michigan and Michigan State game will be on CBS and Super Bowl Fifty. say after this Penn State game it, it sets up two critical uh, games for, in terms of a uh, conference standing standpoint for Michigan because if they can win one or maybe even both let's not let's let's do the dream scenario okay let's say they sweep these two games especially Indiana uh, it would have them no worse what tied for first along with uh, or at least tied for second because Iowa currently still has only one loss in conference play so at Best, you know, just you know, probably realistically at best, if they win these next two games, still only they would be tied for second uh, with Maryland and Indiana. I know they've already beaten Maryland before, so I guess they would what give them a tiebreaker, so to speak. You know, it's kind of hard to figure that out, but still, you know, as of right now, and especially if they perform well enough in these next two games, this two game stretch or three game stretch, they would still be be in that top four in the Big Ten Conference standings and still believe in probably a conceivable shot at the top two or even the outright lead. Uh, and that's very nice to see and say, considering where you know some of the troubles and problems and concerns that people had about this Michigan team, this Michigan team in you know in the uh, preseason score, yeah, but the out of conference schedule portion of the season and before Karis Levert went down with another injury. So seeing it perform like this is very inspiring to see. Yeah, it is very inspiring. I, I would, I would have to think. And speaking of Michigan, as we move on, their school has has hired uh, Ward Manuel as their new athletic director. Touchdown, Michigan! Ward Manuel, as I look at the history here, up oh, there it is. From 1998 to 2000, he was a, a Michigan assistant athletic director. Then from 2000 to 2005, he was the Michigan associate athletic director. I don't know what what's uh, what the difference is between assistant and associate. Then from 2005 to 2012, he became the Buffalo athletic director, the university at Buffalo Bulls. And then from 2012 to 2016 the Yukon Huskies athletic director, and now he's back here in Michigan as the head athletic director. He was also a Michigan defenseman line, a defensive line. He was also a Michigan defensive lineman from 1986 to 1989. This one from DTM.com. Yeah, he played under Bo Schembler. He played under Bo Schembler. Indeed. He said, btn.com says from, Ty, from Tom Deinhardt, a senior writer, that Manuel's love of Michigan is apparent, calling this a dream job at his press conference today. He's a Michigan man. He wore the famed wing helmet. He was screamed at and molded under King Wolverine Bo Schembechler, Bo Schembechler and that's the ultimate seal of approval up and down state and main streets in Ann Arbor. Disposed AD Dave Brandon also was a former Michigan football player and a bow guy, but unlike Brandon, a former pizza executive who resigned in October 2014 amid growing unrest about his cold bottom line style and seeming lack of, res- lack of respect for tradition, Manuel doesn't come from the corporate world. And it was that business mindset that Brandon brought to Ann Arbor that may have been his ultimate undoing. How is Manuel different from Dave Brandon? John U. Bacon said, uh, wait, John U. John U. Bacon, a noted author, college teacher, speaker, and Michigan alum. 
John Bacon said, quote, just about every way is possible. Great athletic department experience gets the whole picture and stays in the background, unquote. And what's on Manuel's to-do list? Bacon said, quote, first don't break it. Second would be building a relationship with Jim Harbaugh and the other coaches. And the third thing, eventually he has to get to cost reduction within the, within the department, unquote. Michigan looks primed for a Michigan look Michigan looks primed for a run of success. Momentum permeates the athletic department after some tumult the last decade. The basketball program is revving up after taking a step back in 2014 to 2015. That's last season. Prior to that, John Beeline took the program to the NCAA title game in 2013 and to the Elite Eight in 2014 before last year's 16 to 16 clunker. And then there is football, where excitement and optimism are off the charts after a smashing 10-3 and debut by Harbaugh, including a Buffalo Wild Wings Citrus Bowl win easily, 41-7 to over the Florida Gators in Florida. Thank, uh, in Tampa Bay, Florida, I would believe. Thank interim AD Jim Hackett for that, is he was one who pulled off the coop of all coops by luring Harbaugh back, to, back home to Ann Arbor prior to, prior to 2015. History may tell us it was one of the greatest feats in school history as Harbaugh has the programs primed to make it uh, primed to make it primed to make a run at not just its fir- not just its first Big 10 title since 2004, but perhaps at Michigan's first national championship since 1997. All things seem possible under Harbaugh, a teammate of Manuel's in 1986. And a seat in the big ta- and a seat in the big house once again is a cherished possession, as Michigan Michigan takes aim at passing rivals Michigan State and Ohio State on the gridiron. A native of uh, Manuel was a native of New Orleans, who was Michigan and and he and he is Michigan's fifth athletic director since 1997. He and he and they are needing him to keep this train moving forward for a department that has a $151 million budget and a staff of three fifty. The there is no denying the success the forty seven year old Manuel enjoyed the last four hours the, the last four years at UConn which included six national championships highlighted by dual titles for the men's and women's basketball teams in 2014. He took over UConn in February 2012 while the school was working through academic sanctions that kept the Huskies out of the 2013 NCAA tournament. Manuel also prov- Manuel also pr- Manuel also proved a steady hand in the transition from iconic hoops coach Jim Calhoun to Kevin Oley. The program has thrived post posting back-to-back perfect academic progress reports to the NCAA in addition to on-court success. Prior to UConn, Manuel was athletic director from 2005 to 2012 at the University of Buffalo, which he helped establish as a Division I program. Manuel pumped life into Buffalo, beginning with the hiring of Turner Gill as a head coach. Manuel also changed the image of the school with a new logo and pumped up the athletic department budget from 11 to $25 million. Now Manuel is home and he's looking to make Michigan great. That's the end of it. So uh, I, I would believe Manuel would uh, would be even better than Jim Hackett. Yeah, and, and, and that's saying something concerning what Hackett was able to uh, accomplish or help usher in during his brief, brief tenure as the quote-unquote interim athletic director, you know, not just bringing Harbaugh, but of course uh, re-upping, getting Michigan back up under the Nike apparel, and of course um, Michael Jordan announcing that uh, that the Wolverines will be sporting the, the famous Jumpman logo next year. So all this happened underneath, you know, the quote-unquote interim tenure of Jim Hackett. So part of me was a little bit saddened that he that he had to leave. But like I said, you know, you need to get somebody in there. And I think Manuel probably be the right man for the job. He has the experience. Obviously, obviously, obviously as you can see, 
uh, especially what he did under UConn. Because you remember, you know, like you mentioned, uh, like it, like the article uh, specifically mentioned, you know, there were some very uneasy times and around that stretch of 2012, around that time in 2012 for UConn. So for him to bounce back for that, not just on the, uh, you know, not just on the athletic floor, but also on the academic floor as well, uh, it caught. I'm sure it caught a lot of people's attention in, in Ann Arbor and and, and put. Uh, uh, manual on their radar, so to speak. So, you know, it probably helped help them let you know led to this decision uh, that we saw now. Yep. So with that out of the way, we transition to uh, NFL football. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! In between the NFC and AFC championship games and the Pro Bowl at some point. The Lions have hired former New England Patriots Director of Player Development Kevin Anderson as Head of Football Operations and Assistant General Manager behind General Manager Bob Quinn after the Patriots were eliminated by the Denver Broncos in the AFC championship game 20-18 to at Sports Authority Field the previous Sunday. According to Tim Twentyman of DetroitLions.com, he was uh, he was hired to be the new chief of staff and assistant to the general manager. He'll report directly to GM Bob Quinn. He, Anderson spent the last ten years in the Patriots football operations department and the last five years as the director of player development. According to his bio on Patriots.com, Anderson's main focus was to assist athletes with their transition into the NFL and provides support dur- both during and following their careers. His other duties including his other duties his other duties included coordinating several logistical aspects of mini camp, training camp and team travel. He has a degree in marketing and management from Indiana University, the Hoosiers, the Crimson and Cream. The Lions let go former Vice President of Football Operations Cedric Saunders last week as Quinn wanted a new direction for his football operations department. That was it from Tim Twentyman right there. So, um, So, I would would believe that was it. Mini Patriots reunion, you know, sort of like a a regrouping, so to speak. uh, Yeah. Revitalization, whatever you want to call it. And they're trying to establish, plant their own flag here in the North here in the NFC North, specifically here in Detroit. So it's, it's, it's nice to see. Yeah, I believe so. I think the Lions are uh, trying to make a, a championship culture, even with uh, Jim Caldwell remaining as their head football coach. We need not bother uh, talking about him anymore because uh, we'll, we'll still have to see. We'll still have to see what 2016 can bring the Lions and bring to the Lions and their fans. We'll, we'll have to see what the Lions can do in 2016 and things like that. The, it's it's not going to be an easy schedule like we mentioned in the past, but uh, we'll see. So with that out of the way, we transition to hockey. <laughs> Red Wings center Dylan Larkin was selected to the NHL All-Star Breakaway team recently, earlier earlier this week. And of course, he'll be in the All-Star game in Nashville on Sunday night, I believe 8 o'clock on NBCSN. Saturday, of course, is the skills competition. Uh... We discovered some uh, advanced, incredible advanced statistics about Dylan Larkin from advanced statistician for winging in Motown, Prashant Iyer, who was uh, on the Schuling Report on the Team 92 on FM WQTX in St. John's and Lansing earlier this week. By the way, getting to the stats right now, Larkin was compared with uh, 
Arnami Panarin of the Chicago Blackhawks. Larkin has 15 goals, 18 assists, 33 points, third among rookies third among rookie scores, Panarin with 46 points and tied for 11th in points among players. Players overall of any age. Now, more of it comes with uh, comes with uh, Larkin and Zetterberg and Panarin with and with and without Patrick Kane. Larkin with Henrik Zetterberg, 5 on 5 total total time uh, five on five time time on ice TOI four oh two point seven seven minutes. I don't know how to convert point seven seven minutes into seconds, but um, five point five CF percentage shot at ten percentage forty nine point one percent five point five goals per game one point one nine and five point five points per game two point six eight. Larkin without Zetterberg, five on five total ice time, 260.47. Five on five shot attempt percentage, 52.1%. Five on five goals per game, 1.15. Five on five points per game, 230. Now to Artemy Panarin and Patrick Kane. Panarin with Patrick Kane, five on five total ice time, 688.17. 5.5 shot attempts percentage, five uh, 54.4, 5 on 5 goals per game, 1.13, and 5.5 points per game, 2.35. Panarin without Kane, 5, five on 5 total ice time, 113.63, 5 on 5 shot attempt percentage, 45.1, Five on five goals per game, zero, an absolute zero. Five point five points per game, zero point five three. And then, then next off, uh, Prashanth Iyer tweeted on Twitter at Iyer underscore Prashanth. In the one eighty eight minutes and forty two seconds of five on five, where Larkin is on the ice without Datsuk or Zetterberg, the Red Wings have outscored the opposition twelve to four with a fifty point six. Shot attempt percentage. Now here's Zetterberg's statistics with and without Larkin. Zetterberg with Larkin, 5 on 5 total ice time, 402.77. 5 on 5 shot attempt percentage, 49.1. 5 on 5 goals per game, 0 0.74. 5 on 5 points per game, 1.94. 1 1 Zetterberg without Larkin, 5 on 5 total ice time 322.9 5 on 5 shot attempt percentage 5 uh 50.3 5 on 5 goals per game 0 0.19 5 on 5 points per game 0 0.56 also uh, also Prashant Iyer threw in Jack Eichel of the Buffalo Sabres into the mix he's got 16 goals and 18 assists 34 points total and then the top three most common line mates for Eichel, Evander Kane, Brian Gianta, and Jamie, Jamie McGinn for Artemy Panarin. Patrick Kane, Artemy Anisimov, and Jonathan Taves, the captain. And then for Dylan Larkin, Henrik Zetterberg, Justin Ablocator, and Brad Richards. So, with, so as far as Dylan Larkin and Henrik Zetterberg are concerned, Ed... I think they are better off playing together more to help produce more offense. I I think if Jeff Blaschel gets the message like either soon or now, I would I would have to uh predict and believe that the Red Wings could uh produce more offense. This is that's that's uh, the that's the main chemistry that the Red Wings are looking for, wouldn't you think? Well, definitely, and there's also a comfort level, too, when it comes to it. Uh, obviously, being out there with your captain uh, not gives you a mental sense of, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. He's going to be the leader that the general for us out there on the ice. Um, 
not necessarily X's and O's all, all the time, but just pointing out what spots we need to do, what we need to cover. And also, like I said, just that for that mental edge of uh, being that emotional leader of certain, certain instances, uh, granted, it might not always play out in terms of offense production because obviously Zetterberg is nowhere near uh, the type of player he used to be years ago. But still, you know, when you, when you, when you have him involved with a young player like 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 Dylan Larkin, it could help in, in turn cause him to feel a little bit inspired in some ways as well. So um, to see, you know, it probably, yeah, would be a good note also to, to Jim Blasio. Maybe we could probably uh, utilize this more seeing, I've I, seen that effects that it's having so far. Yeah, I, I believe so. Uh, elsewhere in the NHL, Calgary Flames defenseman Dennis Weinman was suspended indefinitely for cross-checking a linesman. It'll, it'll, it'll depend on the upcoming hearing that he will receive in the near future at some point. Uh, Dennis Weinman harming one of the linesmen, one of the, uh, one of the officials, a member of the officiating crew of the National Hockey League, intentionally, and I saw I saw it on a highlight on NHL Network and on ESPN too, and on ESPN as well. An official, you say, correct? It it it, it was technically a linesman. Uh, it was actually a a member of the of the NHL officiating department. Yeah, that's the officiating crew. You know, that's just that's just that's just something you can't do. Like accidental or not, you gotta be aware of who's on the full, who's on the ice at all times, and who, and especially of all people, a member of the officiating, uh, member, of, uh, right, a referee, an official. Um, you know, it's it's in ways it's it's a bit different if you were if it was against a player. They, you know, that's the nature of the game. Players welcome this. Players are expecting this, but not the referees, not the officials. They're just there, right, to call the action and call the action, force the rules, uh, not to get hit by the actual players. So um, I think this is something that could have been avoided. Um, you know, and as I, as I'm looking into it. Oh my goodness, especially looking at the video, like, come on, what the hell was that all about? Like, yeah, he might have been in your way, but that's no friggin' way to treat an official. So, yeah, he definitely deserved that suspension, period. Yeah, that was a crazy thing to do. You're crazy! Ah! Ah! You're crazy! You're crazy! Are you crazy? Well, players that, uh, lay their, that, uh, like like lay their hands on the official or uh, push them or cross check them might uh, are are subject to receive a ten game or a fifteen game suspension. That was the that was the previous rule that I learned in terms of players uh, uh, making physical contact with an officiating member, whether it's an official or a linesman. That that was the last I. That was previously when I saw one of the New York Ranger players uh, make physical contact uh, with a linesman, and and he got suspended for I, I believe ten games. But uh, Gary Bettman, the, the NHL commissioner and the NHL Department of Player Safety, and the Board of Governors are are looking are still looking into it. We still have no word on on. How many games Dennis Weidman will be suspended for? I'd say at least ten games. You know, especially after you look at the video evidence here. You know, you could you could say, oh, he had an excuse, he had a defense, he was dazed after getting on his own. But the fact that he clearly saw the ref was in front of him, went up, cross checked him, and his reaction after all of it uh, showed the old man with no remorse. So why should we show him to give him any benefit of the doubt? No, you suspend his ass and suspend him as long as you possibly can. Yeah, that was that was like uh, five or six seconds after he was hit from behind by one of the Nashville Predators players at Scotiabank Saddledome when the Predators were playing the Flames in Calgary. And um, and uh, Weinman was uh, apparently wondering why that hit 
wasn't being called by the officiating department. Maybe he, maybe Weidman wanted to uh, make an example out of uh, out of one of the linesmen for that. That was that would be a second reason. Not only was the linesman in his way, but uh, the officiating crew didn't 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 make it make a call for it. I, I, but I thought but I thought that was a clean hit in in my in my view. And there was no reason for there was no reason either way for any any player whatsoever to uh, harm a member of the officiating crew. Yeah, I mean you gotta find you gotta you gotta find yourself one damn good reason uh, to even attempt some crap like that. It, and it better be justified. That was not justified in any sense, any way, shape, or form. Yeah, that's true. End of story. I think we've covered all hockey news and statistics, advanced statistics, that is. That's what the Detroit Sports Truth is all about. Cracking cases, uh, cracking, uh, tracking down advanced statistics, doing very extra hard work for, for the Detroit teams that everybody cares about. It's not just, uh, it's not opinion-based, as everybody should know. It is facts, truth, and evidence. All, all that, all that, everything that is, that's true, because the truth is out there. Now to baseball news. That one is long gone. Couple quick notes: uh, the Tigers have traded Jeffrey Marte, an infield, the infield, a uh, utility infielder, to the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim for utility infielder Cody Eaves. Not much to see there. If you want to look up Cody Eaves, go to Tigers.com or MLB.com to do some research. I recommend you do, to do that in case you don't know who he is. Second note, the Houston Astros signed former Tigers starting pitcher Doug Fister to a one-year $7 million deal. Um, considering the Tigers should have gotten Doug Fister back, um, the Tigers uh, apparently made a mistake. Uh, by signing Mike Pelfrey. Well, in terms of you, after seeing the amount of money uh, that Fister, uh, you know, uh, was signed for, some would say, "Hey, you know, you probably could have gone after him for for that aspect." Um, but it is a one-year deal that he's signing, so it leaves the door open. But hey, if the Troy wants feels or sees a need. Uh, to go after him next off season, they might very well could, and it could be a very, very similar price. So not all is lost in that regard. Yeah, I believe that's true. That's probably all there is to it. Well, we're, uh, you know, our, where all that leaves us. It's time for five questions. It's time for five questions with Taylor the Gator Phillips. Question number one: How much money do you think Andre Drummond should be fined for uh, his his verbal altercation with Detroit Sports Rag managing editor Justin Spiro, who was at the right end of the court at, at the end of the game? If there is a fine, I would expect it not too steep, but it will it, be. You know, uh, I'd say what around the five, ten grand range. That 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 type of aspect. All right. Next question. Question number two. Since Andre Drummond was hitting more free throws uh, th- than we expected uh, prior to the Cleveland game, which uh, he missed more than he made. Could the hack drummond strategy be more of a mistake by all the other teams now and in the near future? No, because, again, Drummond is still at a very, he's still at a career low in terms of percentage-wise for his free throw shooting. Um, and, again, as a joke, as you saw as you saw in the Cleveland game, he will still have tendencies where he can go very, very, very cold, very bad in stretches. Um, so, no, uh, if I was the opposing team, hell yes, I would keep the strategy up as long as I possibly could. This is a this is a, a wake up call to Drummond. Listen, you may not like it, but I'm telling you, big man, you, you got to get this better. You got to improve on it, whether it be form, how you shoot it, how you release it, your your rhythm, your routine, whatever. You 
got to improve on it, point blank. And keep improving as well. Next question. Are the Michigan State Spartans back on track? Question number three. I'll be honest, I, won't, I probably won't be so certain um, until they face Michigan. That would actually be the telltale sign as whether or not, uh, hey, they're fully back on the rebound and now they can probably contend for a Big Ten title game. So I would say, um, you know, the, the real true indicator of, of the answer to that question would be watch the Michigan game the day before the Super Bowl. Next question. Question number four, where can the Michigan Wolverines teams go from here with Ward Manuel as their new athletic director? Well, if, if they feel inspired enough to look at what, what, what happened under UConn during his, uh, at UConn under, under his regime, uh, expect good things at the very least. Um, especially you looking to build off the momentum that Jim Harbaugh's first year uh, had created. So, you know, it wouldn't be outside of a possibility, especially for the where the football team is concerned, you know, to start competing for and start expecting to see the team compete for championships. Next question. Question number five, finally. Should Dylan Larkin, Henrik Zetterberg, and Pavel Datsuk get more ice time on the same line, especially in a similar line, to help the team win more games and have a better shot at being a Stanley Cup contender? I wouldn't necessarily see the whole Stanley Cup contender thing, but in terms of what we've seen from the numbers as presented by Prashant Thayer, um, try experimenting with this with this with this form a little bit more. You know, it's 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 working for you so far. Uh, it's getting Larkin not just experience but production as well, and you're seeing you're getting some usage out of Zetterberg for what, uh, however many remaining years uh, is left on in his career, whatever he has left in the tank in, in his in his instance. So yeah, you know, keep trying. Experiment a little bit more with the formula and see what see what results you get, and we'll see what you come up with. All right. Well, that answers five questions, and that wraps up episode one ninety two of the Detroit Sports Truth. Ed, I thank you. We will talk Monday at midnight. midnight. Yep. Looking forward to it, Taylor. And for Ed Smith, I'm Taylor Phillips. If there's any, if there's anything you fans want more of or less of on our podcast please let us know we will talk to you guys monday at midnight on spreaker for episode 193 ttfn ta-ta for now